It's not my eye that tells me about the sun necessarily. There are blind men who know all about the sun. You don't need an eye to know it's there. There's lots of ways to establish the sun is there without looking at it. But they're telling you that a mystery is a truth. But you only have one faculty, one organ that can see truth, your mind. And they tell you, well, your mind can't look at it. See, if the sun was a thing that could only be detected by means of the eyeball, and none of us had eyeballs, then no one could insist you must believe in the sun. It wouldn't be fair. I have no way to know if it's there. For someone to say, you must believe this is true, but I have no way of looking at it with that organ that sees truth, how can this be a fundamental article of my faith, something I must believe, because I can't believe it. I can promise to say it, but I don't believe it. I've never seen it or seen any indication of it. I've never, just as the sun, I may not have seen it, but I feel its warmth. I know there's something there. A mystery is a thing that's true and it has no indications. There's other philosophical difficulties. I don't know how much of it you may have heard in other talks when I've been through here. Uh, but again, these are Quranic principles to point out that we should think about what we say. If we say, God adopts a son, God produced a son, that neither one of these are meaningful. Could a man adopt a dog as a son? He could fill out all the papers. Some people do. They put it in the newspaper as a joke. The man said, I filled out all the legal form. The dog has his own bedroom. He has a scholarship to university. I set a place for him at the table. The dog is my son. And they write it up in the newspaper so we can all laugh at a crazy man. Because a dog is a different thing than a man. It's not meaningful. A dog can't act like a son. He can only act like a dog. It's too big a difference, man to dog. In the same way, how can God take a man as a son? There's too big a difference. A man could be treated like a son, I suppose, but can he act like a son? There's nothing in him divine. He's not divine. So they solve the problem and they say, well, when God adopts us as sons, he gives us a little bit of divinity, a little spark of divinity. We're, we're like him. We share his nature just a little bit without realizing that divinity is a thing you don't share. When you say divinity, it's not a thing you get. It's not an achievement. It's not an acquisition. Divinity is a condition by which you've always been divine. You don't get there. Divinity means priority. Who is God is the owner because there was nobody before him. That's why he's the owner. He has priority. Anybody else might reach for these things, but he was there first. In a similar way, he does not produce a son because to produce something, that is a son, is a derived item. But a son has to be like his father. So the son of God has to be unproduced because that's what his father's like. That's why the, it's a self-defeating proposition. If you say that one is the son of God, he resembles his father. In fact, he doesn't have a father, just like his father. So he's nobody's son. There's no such individual, lam yeled as the ayah says. There's more direct things, as I say, speaking of details. Somebody mentioned just the other day this very point that if you talk about the Bible to people, they'll tell you, uh, you're quoting out of context. That's a favorite phrase they use. I think some people say it, they don't know what it means. Quoting out of context, and what they mean is you, you took that thing off the page, you didn't look at what came before and after it. That's the accusation made. That's how some people wrote the Bible. They quoted out of context. Matthew chapter 2 tells the story of Jesus saying when he was a young man, his family ran away to Egypt. 
so that the scripture would be fulfilled which said, Out of Egypt I called my son. And he quotes from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. If you look up that verse, you find out he quoted half a sentence. The full sentence is not talking about God's son. It's talking about the nation of Israel. It says, When Israel was a youth, I loved him. Out of Egypt I called my son. In other words, he treated Israel like a son, called the nation out of Egypt. And people say, oh yes, but this Israel, that means Jesus. It was a picture of Jesus. Is it? As you keep reading, the next verse says, but every time I called him, he turned instead and worshipped idols. That's what the next verse says. So how can that possibly be applied to Jesus? But whoever wrote Matthew did, because he quoted out of context to make his point. The same Matthew who will tell you that 41 divided by 3 equals 14 in the beginning of his book. He gives a list of 41 names and tells you they fall into three groups of 14. He's missing a name somewhere. You can find out which name it is because there's another list drawn up in another place. Which means there's a problem here. There's, something isn't accurate. Maybe that's a warning to us that we shouldn't insist on the accuracy of the book because here's an obvious mistake. So in summary, going by experiences that I've had, the things I've tried to outline here, whether people have embarrassed themselves by the foolish things they've said, or whether uh, people have uh, come to confusion and been happy about it, they've rejoiced in it, or whether you have seen sources which confuse themselves, as I just mentioned, the point is that people have misplaced their trust in sources or other people or in themselves. They've listened to people who are ill-informed, or who were well-informed but dishonest, or they listen to themselves, who have become informed and remain dishonest with themselves. It's the uh, as many heartwarming stories that I've heard of people and, and met for myself that have chosen Islam because they decided to be honest with themselves. As a friend of mine had told me not that long ago, he was in Europe, and he met uh, Muslima. She had been a Catholic nun, and she was now working as a hos in a hospital. She had training as a nurse, and he was a doctor. And he asked her that uh, how was it that uh, she chose Islam anyway when she was a, had been a nun for many years. And she said one day she just was honest enough to say to herself what she knew was the truth. She said, "The more we knew about our religion, the more confused we got." and realize that's not how I achieve success in anything else in life. If you're going to school and you're getting more confused every day, then you're taking the wrong subject. More likely there's something wrong with your teacher. Uh, the point is that's not how education is supposed to work. You learn more so you get rid of the confusion. You get more accurate and you know it better. You don't sacrifice accuracy for the sake of understanding. The more you know, the less confused. So if you find yourself getting more confused the more you hear, probably you're pointing in the wrong direction. There's even a verse uh, from the Bible that says, God is not the author of confusion. So I guess I have taken much longer than we uh, had in mind even, uh, but I thank you again for your uh, time and attention. I'm always uh, glad to have the chance to uh, pass through here and share some uh, ideas with you. Alhamdulillah. Oh, yes, I don't know what the circumstances are. Yeah, what is it? You're probably going. Uh, Islam and Christianity concerns scriptures. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, we thank Brother Gary for a beautiful lecture tonight. And before we start question time, we'll have a small announcement to make, which is uh, tomorrow in Abu Dhabi, there'll be a lecture in the Adnok Lecture Hall, which is under the title of uh, Islam and Christianity. And uh, I think it starts at 8.30. So if anybody has a question, please raise your hand and uh, the lecturer will go ahead and answer it, I guess. Don't be shy. Go ahead. Yes. 